Howdy y'all, this is Ashley Parker, and today I'm going to be talking about graphic novels, or what our friend Lupton uh, referred to as picture books for adults. She says that picture books aren't just for kids, and I have to agree. Graphic novels and illustrated books have become important literary and artistic genres. They use a dynamic pictorial matter, so the images have to come alive for the reader to tell the story. They might leap around, they might wander off a page. Even the lettering, uh, as placed inside text bubbles or sometimes coming out of text bubbles, uh, can dramatically change the tone and direction of dialogue. So I think that's a really important note that um, as I go through these books I have piled just off screen, you'll see what I'm talking about. So the first book I want to talk about is The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Y'all might know the movie. It stars Sean Connery. Uh, I, I think it's okay, an okay adaptation, although not a spectacular film. I enjoy it, though. But this written by um, world-famous Alan Moore and illustrated by Kevin O'Neill. Now, if you've ever seen this book, you'll notice that it has some really, really intricate uh, and very detailed art to it. I don't know if y'all can see that there. Let's see. Uh, so we have... Uh, the series was co-created by The Pair, and it began in 1999. It was supposed to be kind of a Justice League for Victorian England, but it quickly developed into an opportunity to merge elements from many different works of fiction into one world. So this starts off in 1898, so you get a lot of the steampunk vibe, you get a, um, a lot of alternate Victorian universe, it's very cool. Uh, we have the main, the main character, Mina Murray, who comes from uh, Stoker's Dracula. And she has to <clears throat> recruit Alan Qu Quartermain from King Solomon's Mines, right? It's that character. Uh, let's see. Okay, here. I'll just give you another example. This is one of the first spreads that you see. So we have a very large um, part of the spread here. And again, it's, it's extremely detailed. See all that? Uh, pardon my note here. So uh, the figures are also somewhat exaggerated in O'Neill's art. I mean, you see, you see how his shoulders are just amazing, and he's got these little teeny legs, but then she's got these mutton sleeves that would poke out your eye. Uh, it's really, really beautiful stuff. So um, each chapter has a sort of tableau effect going on. Um, or, or an important moment as we as we see the chap the chapter change. Um, another thing that I will point out on the way to the end of the first chapter is the use of these different um, panels. So sometimes when when they want to really focus on a single moment, they'll use a lot of little different panels. So here we have a twelve. Um, sometimes you get nine to a page. Sometimes six. Sometimes four. Sometimes they completely wander off and do their own thing. Uh, here's one with six on it. You know, he's he's looking around pretty bewildered. And then here we have, for a huge dramatic moment, a full page of the Nautilus coming up. It's pretty cool. Let's see what else. Uh, so in this book, you'll, uh, you'll run into people like Captain Nemo. You'll run into Dr. Jekyll and Edward Hyde. I'm sure you all know who I'm talking about. Uh, the Invisible Man from H.G. Wells is in here. Fu Manchu is one of the villains. He's a he's an archetype of evil criminal genius, as well as Professor Moriarty of Sherlock Holmes fame. So the world is sort of Victorian England here, but they also jump into H.G. Wells' War of the World. Um, and they jump later into later books. They get into the world of 1984. It's very bizarre. A lot of in-jokes from Victorian literature in here, too. Uh, let's see. It's gonna find you the end of a chapter. Uh, this book actually has actually has perfect binding. Um, the leaves of the page are bound by gluing, and the back folds are cut off, and so it's not sewn together at all. Oh, okay, so here, so we have the moment where they meet Hyde, and he's been drugged, and then falls out a window. So this is how the chapter ends and also begins. It kind of picks up right where it left off. So here I'd like to add that graphic novels and comics are traditionally hand-lettered by an artist who specializes in customizing scripts for each of the comics. 
Um, they are called a letterer. They have a super underappreciated and underrecognized job. Um, so the next thing we'll talk about is The Watchmen, and I'm sure y'all all know about this movie. Another one written by Alan Moore. This one is illustrated by Dave Gibbon and is published by DC Comics. So the first thing you'll notice is this dramatic red drop of blood on the, co on the cover. It's a motif that shows up throughout the book. Um, got some more of this perfect binding. It's a paperback. They sell this in hardback too, but I think it was really expensive. So um, uh, what I think is really cool about this one though is that the question arises throughout this novel, who watches the Watchmen? And the clue is thus, the answer is also here. If you open it up, watch men. Who watches the Watchmen? You do, as you read the book. I love it, it's so great. So Moore used the story in this book to uh, reflect contemporary anxieties and to deconstruct and parody the superhero concept. So if you haven't seen the movie, Watchmen is kind of an alternate universe where superheroes emerged in the 40s through the 60s or so, and their presence changed U.S. history. So the U.S. won the Vietnam War, like, no questions asked. Watergate never happened. Uh, the country is edging toward World War III with the Soviet Union, and some of the superheroes who were formerly freelance now work for the government. And the story focuses on the personal development and moral struggles of these protagonists as an investigation into the murder of one of these government-sponsored heroes unfolds and pulls them out of retirement. Um, let's see. So most of the time you're going to get a nine-grid layout in this, in this particular book. Uh, interestingly, oh, I don't know. Um, there is a part right in here where an excerpt from one of the characters' autobiographies is included. So we have, you know, we have art over here, and then we have an excerpt from Hollis Mason's autobiography, Under the Hood. He's, a, he's an older superhero who's now retired and passed on the mantle. But we have his autobiography reprinted here, and it weaves into and out of the story. Uh, here's a good example of a chapter ending. I know I talked about that earlier. So it ends. This is the doomsday clock. But then it opens up with a full page. Chapter two. The title of the chapters is pushed later into the story. The, the panels do shift in this as well. I mean, most of the time you get nine, but sometimes, sometimes not. Sometimes you get one like that. And there's the title chapter. Let's see. Oh, okay. Oh, I know. Here's a really good note about that font thing I was talking about. Um, some of the smaller dialogue in some of the bubbles is informational. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. You know, um, the red hood sees uh, the damsel in distress, and it'll be in a little rectangle, you, you know, a very casual, readable, sans serif font. But sometimes you get, in this one especially, you get into something like this, where, oh, pardon me, um, the oddly shaped dialogue bubbles are present, and that font is a, is a kind of a script. It's a uniform script, and the feeling that we're supposed to get from this is that it's kind of an unstable individual mumbling in an irregular monotone. Uh, I think Jackie Earl Haley did a really lovely job of portraying Rorschach in the film, so if you have that voice in your head, like I do, then this makes perfect sense. Let's see. All right, let's move on to the next one. Let's see. The next one is um, a traditional DC comics. I know if y'all know about DC, right? Uh, it's The Ring, The Arrow, and The Bat. This one is a little bit unusual because it's a compilation of other stories that happened a while ago. Um, again, seeing that perfect binding, this particular paper is uncoated, unlike the others. So you can kind of feel, feel the ink in your fingers, it's kind of cool. Um, it has no extra coating or paper finishing, so there's not going to be any glare to the surface. It makes it ideal for prints that have a lot of text, 
um, a lot of reading material. Uh, it's very porous. Um, it's best for smudgeless writing. Um, let's see. Okay, so here here's a good example of some sometimes the paneling kind of moves around on you. So we have we have this this lit panel here is floating above this one as is this one. You're meant to read it in that order. So this sac this this volume collects two Green Arrow team up stories. One in which he teams up with Green Lantern, the other one Batman. Um, and both stories are written by Dennis O'Neill, and they depict Green Arrow's first meeting with Green Lantern and with Batman, respectively. Um, here's a really interesting thing I observed in this book, is that you have the end of the chapter here. So it's Green Lantern standing very menacingly, and he's yelling at Green Arrow. But then, in the next chapter, it's, you know, here's your chapter title, and it picks up right where it left off. Like, almost, almost the same words. Just like in those old commercial breaks, you know, you, you get to the cliffhanger part of the Smurfs or whatever, and then the next, very next thing would be kind of a reiteration of what they just said, just to kind of get you back into it after watching all those cool ads for cereal and toys. Um, okay, here's a good one, of, of example of a full page bleed. So you're, you've got the, the color goes all the way out here, and he's looking pretty, pretty sweet riding on that green carpet. I also can't remember what's happening in this in this part. Otherwise, I'd explain. Um, here's another part where the panels are layered on top, and for some reason the bleed decided to go all the way to the edge here, but they observe the margins here, and you also have that that white um, border to kind of make these panels pop up at you. So, the font in here is kind of a typical comic book font. Um, again, it's all hand lettered, so there, there's not some, it's not Comic Sans, and it's not something that you're going to be able to necessarily just find. You're going to have to know kind of what you're looking for. And anymore, from what I understand, a lot of the comics that are produced have fonts that are based on this beautiful old hand lettering. So you can go to um, certain sites and download whatever you want. But uh, I don't know. I don't know if it'll be the same. The next one I'm going to bring up um, uh, is, is from Marvel, actually, and this is one of the newer comics that they have put out. It's the Unbelievable Gwenpool, and this is hilarious. If you, have, if you enjoy Deadpool at all and his fourth wall busting character, Gwenpool's another one. Uh, not related to Gwen Stacy of Spider-Man fame, although I think she did get pushed over into that at one point. You never can tell. Um, this this book is interesting because it's a sa it's a saddle stitch binding. So we have um, just little staples here and here. They kind of if I pulled it apart, it would just come up in in the leaves, and my brother in law would be furious. He keeps these in plastic. It's um, see. so interestingly in this one. So you pop it open, and just like in any average comic book, you're gonna see the ad for a different uh, a different comic book. Also very cool. Um, in this in this book, the panels do this kind of long thing, and then you know you get you get the motion of the dialogue. She usually speaks in pink, so you kind of can tell who's talking, even whenever her face is not present in the panel. Yeah. Um, here we have an example of of the words coming up off of uh, coming they bust right out of that text bubble, and it's it's so you know that this is supposed to be, it's a loud sound. It's ha ha ha, it's not, it's not in her normal voice. Um, it's also interesting to note that these pages are glossy. Um, it's a coating that provides a lot of shine. It's a higher contrast and a pop of color. Uh, it's, it's good for full color images and Gwenpool, so much color, so, so crazy. Uh, let's see, is there any other cool things in here? No. Just the fact that she talks in pink, I think that's hilarious. Uh, the story with, with Gwenpool, though, is that she is from our world, pretty much, but she somehow ends up in the Marvel Universe, and she knows it. So she she doesn't want to be an extra, so she goes to this costumery and has this poor tailor make her an outfit. But the tailor misreads her application form and thinks that she's written down her superhero name, Gwenpool, and when her name is Gwen. 
cool with an E. So she, she's got this pink outfit and she's running around fighting crime, um, foiling bank robberies, and she somehow doesn't ever, ever get hurt. It's, it's really funny. So, so, so good. She talks to Rocket Raccoon. She, she showed up actually in the end of the Guardians of the Galaxies movie and the very end after the credits, she, uh, or I'm sorry, she didn't show up, but um, Howard the Duck showed up and they're, they're known for their pair up. Sorry. Uh, and she'll reference a whole bunch of other people. Okay, so the next one, um, this one is brand new to me. I haven't read it yet, so I'm not going to flip around too much because I don't want to spoil it. But this is a weird, weird crossover, is it not? Batman and Aliens. So yes, Ridley Scott, like, what is happening here? Uh, DC Comics pairs up with Dark Horse in this one. You always know you're in for a stellar story and some brilliant art whenever Dark Horse comes into play. Um, the pages are really pretty. They're highly glossy. It's like it's like touching a magazine. It's really nice. Um, all the pages have a full bleed effect, so they they all go all the way to the edge, and it's really nice. Um, sometimes they have overlapping panels. Um, there's no white outline to make them stand out, and sometimes the art moves from panel to panel. Um, I think that that kind of lends itself to the continuity of. Um, of the, of the story here. So you see this guy's head is split over two panels and as is his hand and his whole body really, but so you're kind of getting to meet some of these characters. Um, like I said, I'm not going to skip around too much. Just, mm, mm. But I, I, I'm going to guess that Batman wins. I mean, he always does. Does he not? Oh, here's another. Here's a really, really pretty full bleed. So it goes from, it goes from this stellar art right here. I mean, come on. That, that's so cool. There you go. Boom. Batman. I love it. Okay. So here's the one of the weirder comics I own. This one's also a Marvel property. It's called Captain Britain. It's by Alan Davis and Jamie Delano. It's pretty much Captain America, but in Britain. And for a long time, it was a strictly British property. Um, he fights interdimensional evil, I guess. Um... Uh, he is given powers by Merlin. I, it's it's so weird, y'all. It's just such a weird book. Um, the inter the only thing I found just truly interesting, besides this weirdo story, is that they observe the margins. Even whenever you feel like they could have gone with a full bleed, they keep those margins. And then in the, on the very next page, the panels are are given kind of a feathered. A feathered edge to them so I think that's kind of cool. Um, perfect binding again a lot of my books have this uh, it's very very tight still no one's cracked the spine of this book since 1988 we're gonna keep it that way it's awesome it also has uncoated paper so you're gonna gonna you know your feet get your fingers dirty while you're reading it's kind of cool. This last book I'm gonna show you is one of the most beautiful graphic novels I own and I discovered it because of role-playing games um, yes huge nerd if you couldn't tell already, uh, is an independent work by David Peterson. It is called Mouse Guard. Uh, it was, this particular novel was published by Arkea Studios Press, and they're, they're known for their association with Boom. I don't know if anyone knows what that is. So this one, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, it's so pretty. Um, it's hardback, it's, and it's got, this, it's got this beautiful, beautiful binding right here. Um, it's a matte coating on the inside. So the mice, this is all about mice, okay? It's a little bit like um, like Redwall in that aspect. And they, they struggle to survive and prosper against this, this cruel world of predators. Uh, the mouse guard is formed to, ha not, not to fight only, but to kind of help mice get from village to village. So it's very down to earth, day in the life. They do fight occasionally, but not, but not all the time. There's also a lot, there's a lot of intrigue as well. Um, these illustrations just blow me away every time I see them. So they are, they're beautifully etched. This, uh, the palette is kind of this autumnal thing. I mean, here they're fighting a crab, like what? I mean, they're using tiny little weapons. <laughs> it really evokes a children's book, you know, now that I'm looking at it, but there is a lot of intelligence in this writing. And it, so it keeps the adults interested. And uh, I'm, whenever my son starts to really get into reading, I'll be popping this in front of him. Um, the detail in here is just 
lovely, so expressive. Uh, I said that was kind of a matte coating. I could be mistaken. It's catching the light in the way it didn't before. But I just, oh, I just love this book. Um, cool about this book also. Ooh, now it's naked. Take that off, and underneath is a fully uh, colored hard cover. I love that. It's also it's got some color on the spine as well. I think it's really neat. Let's see. All right. Oh, oh, I should also, the end plates are also, also really neat. So this showcases the Mouse Territories uh, from 1150. Oh, you see no my fingers there. So we have all these great names. The Wild Countries over here. Uh, Tyndale, Thistledown. Just, oh, oh, it's so Redwall. Oh, I love it. Um, okay, so that's me. Uh, these are my books. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Hope you enjoyed it and didn't bore your socks off. Um, Cheers.